First, I'm, I'm delighted to see many of my astrophysics colleagues in the audience. Thanks for, for being here. And take that as a sign of support. Many of them knew me as a graduate student and as a postdoc. And uh, my trajectory, my professional trajectory, has been unorthodox, uh, but nonetheless rewarding, which is a kind of an existence proof that not all pathways have to have been taken before. There are some other pathways available that you can carve out. Um, I'm, I have an unorthodox view of awards. One might even say it's contrarian. Um, you know, the awards tend to, you know, they're, they're shorthand really for others to congratulate you for the work you've done. But I would rather be congratulated for your accomplishments rather than for the award given for the accomplishments. And uh, there are interesting examples of this. Consider, for example, in, in 1939, uh, the films Citizen Kane and Wizard of Oz were released. These are two of the most famous films ever made. And we know them uh, not because they won Academy Award for Best Picture, Oscar for Best Picture. In fact, they didn't. Neither did. Um, Citizen Kane won an Academy, uh, a, a, an Oscar for Best Screenplay. Uh, the Wizard of Oz won for Best Song and Best Music. Didn't even get the, the didn't even get the Oscar for Best Special Effects. You think it should be that, right? But it wasn't that. Uh, the film that won for Best Special Special Effects is that unforgettable film called The Rains Came. Remember that one? Yeah, that one got the best special effects. So, so, so the, the award you get and whether you get remembered for something um, don't always correlate. But I think in the end, you'd rather be remembered for what you've achieved and without the award serving as a destination. The film that did win best picture that year was Gone with the Wind deservedly, for sure. Um, but uh, Clark Gable didn't get Best Actor. Uh, that went to the, the unforgettable performance of Robert Donat. <laughs> okay. Uh, in another film, 1935, uh, film buffs know the film It Happened One Night. Uh, that's only one of three films ever to win Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, and Best Actress. Yet that one doesn't rise up, except perhaps among film buffs. It doesn't rise up as one of the films we remember most in the repertoire. I think, of course, that's, that's a different... Academy. Um, <laughs> I had the urge to tell people this weekend I was winning an Academy Award. Um, <laughs> so, but I didn't. <laughs> uh, I think, for example, the Nobel Prize has similar issues such as this. We have a statue of Albert Einstein out front. I don't know any conversation that involves Einstein among anybody where at any time in that conversation someone rushes in and says, did you know he won a Nobel Prize? <laughs> How irrelevant is that fact given his actual achievements that we do remember and that we do know? In fact, by my measure, since the Nobel Prize is, a, is not a career award, it's a it's for specific achievements. By my measure, he deserved at least five separate Nobel Prizes. My picks would be a Nobel Prize for Brownian motion, establishing the existence of atoms, something that 
we presumed were there, but we needed some very good understanding of how and why that would be the case. For the photoelectric effect, separate award for that, demonstrating that light exists in quantized energy states. For special relativity, for general relativity, one of the crowning achievements of the human mind in any century. I would also throw in a little known paper on the stimulated emission of radiation. If that were the only thing he did in life, that's what he'd be most famous for. But now it's almost a footnote in his career, but in fact that is what established, that's what made it possible for us to even think about inventing the laser. We don't think of Einstein when we think of lasers, you should. Yet people win the Nobel Prize you haven't heard of and wouldn't necessarily have known their work. And those people might tend to lead with their Nobel Prize. So the Nobel Prize is proxy for whatever else they might have done. So some people are known for the Nobel Prize. Some people are known for their work that happened to get a Nobel Prize. This kind of also applies to prestigious schools. There are people who attend prestigious schools. And in their lives, that becomes what they lead with. But if they've ever accomplished something important, then the school becomes less relevant. And what they accomplished is what you'd lead with. So, this is kind of the, it, it's, it's a quandary, actually, with awards, because awards are, feel good to receive them. I, I'm not, I won't deny that. It's just that on my deathbed, I, <laughs> I, I don't want people to say he won this award or that award. I want, it'd be nicer if people remembered what I actually did. And... So I feel like I'm in slow motion here, because I actually had a long night. I was at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. That could take a lot out of you just watching that unfold. Um, <laughs> sorry. It's your town here in Washington. What, what, um, in my field, astrophysics, our highest award is the Russell Lectureship, the highest award we give, the American Astronomical Society. And I remember distinctly looking at the history of those winners. And I went down the list. And I said, yep, 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 yep. Every person on that list you've heard of. We know who, I've studied their work. There was a correspondence between my knowledge of their work, how important their work was, how much everybody knew about their work, and the fact they got the highest award which means they don't have to lead on their resume with, I won the Russell Lectureship, because their work precedes them. When I think of the National Academy of Sciences, I don't think of a body of accomplished scientists. Although, of course, most academic science departments will list how many academy members there are in their departments, in, in their universities, as a point of prestige, as a point of pride, as a point of honor. This helps you recruit any next generation of scientists. How many National Academy members are in your department. I don't think of the National Academy that way. A point that's been made several times already this evening. I think of service when I think of the National Academy. The federal charter doesn't say collect a club of smart scientists who can put the membership on their CV. 
and be coveted by those who are not members, be praised by university deans. No. The charter says, create an academy of sciences that can serve the government, can guide policy, who can lead a nation into the future. In that sense, membership in the academy is a duty, not an honor, a duty. I see this public service award, the highest you give in, in recognition of my service. I receive it warmly. But like I said, in the end, it's the details of my service for which I'd want to be remembered and not for the award itself. I want to shift gears briefly and read for you, there's, re there's purpose in this. Just hang with me, I promise. We read for you Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. I can tell you in advance it's 272 words, so uh, you can sit there for that long. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a large sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here. You got that wrong, by the way. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from those honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government by the people, of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. It's Abraham Lincoln, November 19th, 1963. I read this because two years ago, I got a phone call from the Abraham Lincoln Library Foundation. And they asked me, would I mind composing 272 words of my own, reflecting on the Gettysburg Address, the time, the place, the presidency, the war, slavery, anything that I might, <laughs> that might stimulate my urges to write such a speech. And I say, you've got the wrong person. I'm an astrophysicist. Why are you asking me this? They asked it of several dozen people, maybe as many as 50, including uh, former presidents, you know, notable political types, Colin Powell, folks like that. 
And I said, I got nothing to say. I'm not a Civil War reenactor. I'm not an expert in the era. I don't know that I can contribute to this volume that you are creating. So I said, let me sleep on it over the weekend. And I did, and I woke up Monday morning and I said, I know what I'm gonna do. And I did it. I wrote 272 words. And I think I'm the, I may be the only scientist in this collection. I haven't seen every single name. Most of them are politicians and others who affect policy. An added requirement was that after I submitted my 272 words, I had to hand write the speech just as President Lincoln did. <laughs> so uh, I was honored to do so because uh, I own feather pens and fountain pens. It's just a, it's a hobby of mine. And thus it was submitted. This month, the volume of all of these speeches of the 50 of us or so was just published by the Abraham Lincoln Library Foundation. And it's called um, Gettysburg Replies. I'm going to read you what I wrote. The Seedbed. One and a half centuries ago, civil war divided these United States of America. Yet in its wake, we would anneal as one nation indivisible. During the bloody year of his Gettysburg Address, President Lincoln chartered the National Academy of Sciences, comprised of 50 distinguished American researchers, whose task was then, as now, to advise Congress and the executive branch of all the ways the frontier of science may contribute to the health, wealth, and security of its residents. As a young nation, just four score and seven years old, we had plucked the engineering fruits of the Industrial Revolution that had shaped Europe. But Americans had yet to embrace the meaning of science to society. Now, with more than 2,000 members, the National Academy encompasses dozens of fields undreamt of at the time of Lincoln's charter. Quantum physics, discovered in the 1920s, now drives nearly one third of the world's wealth, forming the basis for our computer revolution in the creation, storage, and retrieval of information. And as we continue to warm our planet, climatology may be our only hope to save us from ourselves. During the centennial of its charter, President Kennedy, a photo of him about to address this audience hangs in the corridor. During the centennial of its charter, President Kennedy addressed the Academy membership, noting, the range and depth of scientific achievement in this room constitutes the seedbed of our nation's future. In this, the 21st century, Innovations in science and technology form the primary engines of economic growth. While most remember Honest Abe for war and peace and slavery and freedom, the time has come to remember him for setting our nation on a course of scientifically enlightened governance, without which we may all perish from this earth. Thank you all.